I have a subtitle for this week's Torah portion. We actually enter into uh, the, the, a new book called Deuteronomy or Devarim, but I titled it as something, and it's Crossing the Jordan of the Old Man. The Haftar portion is found in Isaiah chapter 1, very famous chapter, verses 1 through 27. Crossing the Jordan of the Old Man. Look to your neighbor and say, Crossing the Jordan of the Old Man. How many have completed that journey? I don't think any of us have. We're like still trying to cross that old man, right? I don't think we'll ever complete that. Our life is complete in the Messiah, Yeshua, 100%. But it's going to be an ongoing process of crossing over that old man because that old man seems to, to rise up. Even with the most simplest thing, when you're on the road and someone cuts you off, there comes that the Jordan banks are about to overflow. So we got to overcome, you know, I'm just giving a, a kind of a dumb example that most of you guys fall for. Not me, though, but you guys that are probably watching online. Nobody in here, right? Well, you know what I'm talking about is, is sometimes those things transpire. So we're in a constant uh, continuing process. Repentance to Shuvah is repentance is an ongoing thing. We are to constantly be returning to the Father. And you know what? If you've ever been in a river and you try to go downstream, that's easy, right? You go downstream, going with the flow, that's easy. But if you try to, say you're a fisherman, and you get in a certain type of river, maybe it's up to here, and you try to walk forward and, and move forward in that current, it's a little harder. While living, living fish tend to swim upstream. So this is something for us to think about, is true life is not going with the flow of things or with the current situations of the day true life is going the opposite of the way we see things going sometimes we've got to make that initial step to say you know what i'm not going to go that way anymore because it's too easy it's too easy to go with the flow of the fall i'm going to make my process going this way it's going to be harder but you know what the end result is much more rewarding Crossing the Jordan of the old man. Someone look to your neighbor and say, good afternoon, your majesty. Some people, you know, I've gotten emails where people say, why are you saying that? There's no kings there. I said, you must not read your Bible. Because the, the scripture says this, that in the Messiah, we are kings and priests. So I, be, I just believe what the word says. But everything we can see has has been in an actual descending order ever since the, the fall of man. Would you guys agree with that? Actually, all of creation was what I call in a chaotic pause ever since the fall of Lucifer. And we read there's discussions of Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 in that little gap theory area. But ever since the fall of Lucifer and the earth was impacted by this fall, that's why the earth is said to be without form and void. Notice the heavens are not. So the, there was this type of chaotic pause. And all of a sudden the Creator began to speak and begin to restore things back into an order. But it, it's almost as if the Creator stopped at a place where man would wind up being revealed and he would continue on with his process through Adam. It's very interesting. So Adam was actually created perfect. Did you know that? Adam was sinless when he was created. Some might ask, did Adam have a belly button? Then the simple response to that is another question. Did Adam have a mother? That's for you guys to wrestle. But I've heard, I've heard those things. You guys probably have too. But Adam was sinless. He had, if we can say, a type of divine, no offense to anybody, that's very technical, but a type of divine position. And he was stationed directly between a chaotic pause, which we see in Genesis, and the process of the restoration of a fallen world. And I'm getting to something because the message is going to end with restoration and hope. <clears throat> but Adam's, he, Adam, excuse me, Adam was creation's hope sent by Yahweh himself. He was the hope for all creation. He was the ambassador of the creator 
of a restored order, but things actually took what I would say is a, just reading the scriptures, a cataclysmic turn. Would you guys agree with that? A cataclysmic turn of events took place after Adam had fallen. So when Adam fell, all creation went from a a chaotic pause, if we can say that, into a downward spiral and seemingly never-ending descent into darkness. This is the beginning of our Bibles. And all we've seen since then is this, this current type of flow resembling a place that Israel is about to come to now called the Jordan River. We'll read it in just a second. There's some things in there. All creation, you guys. We read our word in Romans. It says that all creation is still groaning. Imagine this. We're talking about words. Devil reams about words. All of creation, you go outside, you probably can't hear it, but Psalm says that creation itself praises the creator. So everything with with and by the wisdom of the creator himself has its own type of language and praises it says the sun the moon and the stars praise him how could that be how how could that we're we're so, we're in a place where if you if it's not coming out of your mouth you're not talking but then there's that phrase that statement actions speak louder than words there's a truth to that but everything is vibrating words is are vibrating and communicating something even the animal kingdom you name it the plant kingdom the the galaxies whatever's out there is constantly praising the creator imagine that even with you sitting there you that are watching online did you know that your body is speaking your very body is saying something. You hear people say body language. Your body is, is talking. There, there, we're, words are constantly being spoken, whether it's out of the mouth or by your attitude. Or I don't like what they're saying, or I don't like that song. You know, just, just, I'm, just, I'm not saying anyone here. I'm just giving examples. You guys see that. Body language, right? She thinks she's all that. But all creation still groans for the manifestation of the sons of God of Elohim. The builders, the scriptures, a son in Hebrew is Ben. He's a bonet. He's a builder. He's a builder. A, son, a daughter is a builder. Anyone who's a, a child of the kingdom is a builder of that kingdom. Creation's waiting for the builders, the heirs of the kingdom which hold the key to this creative power that's to be unleashed in the end of days. Devarim. Look to your neighbor and say, Devarim. Or some say, Devarim. The rabbis probably laugh at us when they hear that. Devarim. It's Devarim. Words. It's basically words. Do you guys know that we're fast approaching? We can see it outside right now. Fast approaching. The season of crossing another threshold that we've never been over on before as mankind. I'm just saying as, as mankind. There's things happening behind the scenes that we would not even think would be transpiring. We're about to see another threshold of a fallen world and descent of the old man just step right in front of us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Father, I pray that your word comes forth today. Your words will come forth today the way you gave them to me. Crossing the Jordan of the old man. This Torah portion, I believe, should truly be titled not just Devarim, but it should have been translated as Eleha Devarim, which means these are the words. These are the words. These are the last words that Moses would end up speaking. I looked at something, and I said, you know, I'm going to do this. I only do this a few times, but it's very interesting that concealed in this entire book of Deuteronomy is actually a mystery of our righteous king. The numerical value of Eleh Hadavarim, these are the words, 
contains a secret that will be revealed, and we'll get to it, pertaining to our righteous king of another Hebrew phrase inside of this book called Deuteronomy. It's Melchizedek Bo or Melech Sadiq Bo, which means come our righteous king. We were just singing a song about him coming. The lamb is not coming again. The king is coming. Hello, I'm talking to you guys. Your king is coming for you. Our king is coming for us. You that are watching online, I don't care what denomination you're a part of. I don't care about all that. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. That's not between you and a Torah terrorist or you between you and some Mr. and Mrs. Know-it-all. I have news for those who came to the foot of the cross, whether it was through Jesus Christ, Yeshua, whatever it is, who has put their faith in the blood of the Redeemer of Israel, your King is coming. Our King is coming. That's a great hope. We have a great hope. We serve the King of Kings and the King is coming. You see, if we see some of these old movies and they say, hey, you got to get your village prepared and get ready. The king is coming. Everybody's getting stuff ready. But sometimes us as people, not you guys in here, but the church down the street, they just sit there. There's really no excitement. There, there's this kind of a stagnant type of thing. Our king is coming and I'm excited. I don't know about anyone else. I'm so excited. You know why? Because the most, the most powerful thing that I'm excited about is I don't have to deal with my worst enemy anymore. Myself. I'm tired of the way this guy acts sometimes. That's my wife. She's tired of the way this guy acts sometimes, and she knows that I'm tired of the way this guy. We have to cross the Jordan of ourself, and I can't wait until it's the final step. We're looking at that Jordan River saying, it's time for you to recede to your lowest level because my inheritance is not in your attitude and your, your immaturity. My, my inheritance in the Messiah is on the other side. Joshua, where are you up? Stand, stand up, Joshua. I'm going with Joshua. I, Joshua's going to take me over. He's going to take me across. Well, I have the Torah, and I'm, well, we need the Torah for everything. Yes, we need the Torah for living. But guess what, Moses, you're not going over there. Pharisees, you can't come over here. You brood of vipers, who told you to come over here? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Show us the fruit of the kingdom in your life, not the burdens that you keep putting on the people. Show me Jesus. Show me Yeshua. Show me my king. Bear the fruit of our king. Hmm. Come, our righteous king. Come, our righteous king. So I don't think it's coincidental that Yeshua came to the Jordan River. I don't think it's a coincidence. Out of every place, why do you have to go to the Jordan? To be immersed into the chaos of the descent of man. He was saying something. Everything the Messiah did spoke louder than what he said, and everything he said was vital. His, his order of things that he said was intentional. The things he said, the things he did in the places he went was intentional. Everything and everywhere Yeshua went was designedly laser beamed intended. It wasn't just happenstance to be like, oh shoot, Peter, we forgot to go over here. Let's go over here. Everything that happened in the life of Yeshua was exacted it was in, it was intentional i don't even know the right words cuz i'm not that smart i'm trying to look for a big word to impress you guys at this moment but i don't he meant what he said and he meant where he went he would become a sin substitute and he would rise up in the power of the spirit and priesthood according to second 
Corinthians 5.21, Yeshua went into the Jordan waters as the king, and he ascended out of the waters as the king who would fulfill all righteousness. Or Melech Sadiq himself, and I'm not teaching people's book or whatever. Moses is actually preparing the last generation. He's preparing the last generation then, and guess what? We need Moses today because Moses prepares the last generation for now. There's always a last generation in every generation. In every generation, there's a last generation. There's always someone needed by heaven to pass the baton on to the next generation. There's always going to be a next generation, and within those generations is always a last generation. What do I mean? There's a chance that you, man, you, woman, will make a decision willfully to say, I won't go any further. I'll stay right here at Mount Horeb, and I won't move. There's always that chance. So there's always a last generation in the next generation. Aren't you glad you're the last generation? See, when you say that, someone might say, now he's getting, he's, he's, he's making, uh, he's setting dates and times. I'm not setting anything. I'm making a factual statement. Every next generation, there's a last generation. There's a potential of something greater. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning says this. <clears throat> See, this whole Torah portion is so boring, it's crazy. It is so boring when you just read through it. It's like, here, it's just, the hit. we already read that. Here's the places that they stood. Here's the giants they fought. Here's what was going on. Here's some warnings. What's so big about three chapters? This is like really boring. I'm going to go to the half Torah portion. But in every Torah portion, there's always something that we can learn, and it's really not that boring. There's always something that Moses has for the people of Israel before crossing over. There's always something Moses said that pointed to the one who can cross over to the other side and us with him always so we're going to see these be the words which Moses spoke unto all of Israel on this side of the Jordan say on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazarot and Dizahav there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seor unto Kadesh Barnea. Imagine that. You all know this. Some of you that might not know this. It, did not take them, it would not have taken them 40 years to get to the promised land. It would have taken them 11 days if they had ears to hear what the Spirit was speaking from Mount Sinai. 11 days. But because of that, a whole generation would die off, and a last generation within the next generation of Hebrews, right, would be the ones to cross over. Verse 3, And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke unto the children of Israel, according unto all that Yahweh had given him in, in commandment unto them. After he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan. These are giants that were in the land. We're dealing with a lot of giants today. Which dwelt at Ashtaroth, in Edre, on this side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab. Isn't it just like, I was, I was cracking up. I gotta, can I share something with you? It's kind of funny. It's, it's, it's with Moses. It's in one of the places. I was busting up. I could not believe this. Here you have, come here, Trent, for a minute. Here we have... After the golden calf incident, here we have, remember Moses struck the rock, the rock the first time? Good son, you struck the rock. It's prophetically pointing to the Messiah who would be struck the first time. The second time, Moses is supposed to speak to the rock. So here's Moses. Can I just narrate something without trying to disrespect in any way, shape, or form? But can you guys follow along? So here's Moses and here's Aaron. And here's Moses speaking to Yahweh. 
And Yahweh's saying, Moses, here's what I need you to do. And he's giving them these instructions. Moses, I want you to speak to the rock and I want you to present my, I want you to present my name to them in a very detailed manner. Can you do that for me, Moses? Yes, Yahweh, I'll do all you say. Yes, Yahweh. Right, Aaron? We're going to do what he says. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Don't get sidetracked by what you did with the golden calf, Aaron, okay? Stay focused. Yes, we're going to do everything. Aaron, come on, you're with me here. We're going to do everything you said, Yahweh, everything you said. We're going to go do exactly what you said, Yahweh. Thank you. we got to back up. It's the king. Come on, back up, back up three. And then we turn, turn around, turn around. We're going to go to the children of Israel. And then here we go. Aaron is standing here. And when I'm speaking, I want you to gradually move off to the side. So here comes Moses. Moses begins to speak to the children of Israel, and he says, here, listen up, you rebels. Here, that's, not ex- that's not what Yahweh told him to do. You listen here. Where are you going, Aaron? Get back over here. Don't you go anywhere. You listen up here, rebels. And he began to strike the rock. And he altered prophecy. Thank you, Trent. I just wanted to give that little narrative. He struck the rock. And he was not supposed to do that. He altered the prophetic pattern of the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah is to be struck once for the nation of Israel. And the next time the Messiah comes would be the communication between the Messiah, Mashiach, Yeshua of Israel and the nation of Israel. You cannot expect a second striking of the date of the Mashiach, it only happened once. So a lot of things happened in these places. I'm going to jump down to verse 5. On this side of the Jordan in the land of Moab, say Moab, began Moses to declare this Torah saying, now, the word for declare here, this Torah, Moses expounded on the covenant that was presented to the people. He's speaking to the last generation's things that had already transpired. It's it's interesting how he's talking. I'll try to express that. This Torah will always speak of the covenant and the voice from Mount Sinai. Mount Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Exodus 33, verse 6. He says, declare, that word declare, it's be'er in Hebrew. It means to declare, to expound on something. But this Hebrew word also means a well or a cistern or the place where water is sustained so it can be drawn out. So Moses was actually opening up the wells of the Torah that were given at Mount Sinai to the last generation. He did not want the last generation drinking from the same cup of the first generation. You see, if you begin to drink from the same religious cup that keeps people from crossing over, you risk as the last generation in that next generation of cutting off the path to your promise of the inheritance. Very, very vital here. So Moses is doing something. The Be'er, this expounding on the Torah, which really means a a well of some sort, was like the water that breaks when a child is about to be born. Moses, who was one drawn from the water, was now like an acting midwife. To the last generation. Moses is also an anagram. You guys know what an anagram is? An anagram is when you look at a word with its letters and another word can be seen with those same letters in Hebrew that happens all the time. So Moshe in Hebrew is also another phrase because of the letters for Hashem, a term used by the rabbis that it really means in Hebrew the name. So Moshe, when you see Moses' name one way, that's what's being presented to the people. What the people are actually seeing is the name of Yahweh in the messenger. A messenger of the Most High will always be an ambassador of his name. See, I'm going to get a lot of people excited because there's many that are dogmatic on the pronunciation of the name. If you argue over the name, you are not an ambassador or representative of that name. 
actions, what you do, says everything of who you represent. Moses didn't represent the name, so therefore he altered the, he, by doing that, he altered the prophecy and therefore was not allowed to go into the promised land. What's happening today? People are striking the Messiah, Yeshua, because of head knowledge. And it's pushing our brothers and sisters away. They're not able to drink from the wells of salvation. Why? Because there's too many religious caps over the wells. The name would now manifest by way of a type of an enigma speech in order to recreate the thinking. What did Pastor Dave preach the, the last week? It was about the mind. To, to recreate the thinking. Someone say recreate. The thinking of the last generation before entering into the promised land. That's what Moses was doing. And if you think about it, if the, if the mind doesn't cross over, that was the problem with the first generation. They physically crossed over, but their minds were still rooted into Egypt. The mind, when the mind goes, the body's going to go sooner or later, right? There's a battle for the mind of man today on many levels, and I'm, I promised I was going to behave, and I will. But don't take Egypt. Look to your neighbor and say, don't take Egypt with you. Don't take Egypt with you in your thinking because a true Hebrew is one whose mind has crossed over onto the soil of his covenant power. This is why we have to put on the mind of the Messiah. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. So if I put on his mind, then I should be living in faith according to his finished work right now. He's slain before the foundation of the earth. He manifested some 2,000 years ago. But I'm supposed to have the mind of the Messiah to live out his finished work as I'm going through the process of crossing over. If that makes any sense. So a true Hebrew is one whose mind has crossed over onto the soil of his Torah and his truth and the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. You can't just have one or the other. You got to have both. So Be'er, this declaring, which also means a well or a cistern, a place dug out to contain water that was not to be sitting there, but was to be drawn out. It was intended to be drawn out, not to sit there. The message of the Messiah that has been embedded in the law of Moses, if I can say that, was never intended to sit on the bema seat of religion. It was intended to, intended to be drawn out and given to the nations that were promised to Father Abraham. So this be'er is also an anagram for another word, bara. This is an act that is only done by God or Elohim, never with man. Man can never bara, create in this fashion like this. It, bara means to bring something forth.